Um, just this topic is very topical at the moment. We're seeing a, a huge amount of organization around um, anti-immigration sentiment um, and certainly tapping into some of the other wider discontent in society, I would say, regarding um, housing, uh, growing inequality. And some of that has been channeled. And particularly, we're seeing that issue around immigration and similar to what we've seen in other countries around Europe, becoming a hot topic and a flashpoint for that kind of wedge of discussion. So I think that's maybe the, the entry point into the, tonight's discussion. Are we seeing in Ireland what we have seen in other countries around Europe? Um, are, we, are, we kind of, are we following the same trajectory a little bit later down the line? Is this something different, something new that we're, we need to approach? And how do we, as social justice minded, um, political activists in different regards respond to that um, and how do we effectively tackle it in a way that is meaningful and I and beyond that how real is it we'll certainly know from online activity that there is an awful lot of voices purporting to be representative of the Irish people that may in fact be coming from Britain, Australia, the US, other places that are sort of getting involved in the debates here for different reasons. So um, being understanding what the situation is here and uh, effectively responding to it. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Teresa Reedy, who is our main speaker this evening. Um, and Teresa is going to talk us through some of her work. So Teresa is a senior lecturer in UCC. She specializes in political institutions and electoral behavior and understanding specifically um, the elections and public attitudes towards elections and engagement with elections. Um, she's commented in the media a little bit recently about those big questions we've seen been asked a lot about the, the role of the far right in Irish politics. Um, and she's going to bring us through a presentation and then I, we will open it up to a wider discussion after that, if that's okay. So firstly, thank you so much to Teresa for giving us her time this evening. And um, yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks a million. It's lovely to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. So I am going to uh, share my uh, slides with you. Uh, hopefully they're coming up there for everybody. Just give it a second to, to work. Yep, yeah, we have them. Thank you. Smashing. That's great. Thanks very much. So, um, I mean, what I'm going to talk to you about is is research that we did at the 2016 and 2020 general elections, and there, you know, uh, that there, there isn't any punchline at the end straight up. There are a lot of people with uh, with um, very hostile attitudes uh, to what we call outgroups in um, in, in uh, political science research. So uh, about twenty percent of the Irish electorate, maybe slightly more at this stage, have, have pretty hostile uh, views uh, to anybody who is different. And it's not going to come as any great shock to anybody here um, that the kind of the the major targets of uh, the hostility, first and foremost, and for a very long period of time has been the traveling community in Ireland. Uh, and that's if, if they kind of, if you want, the acceptable face of racism for a very long time. And then more recently, we've seen uh, kind of immigrants, uh, attitudes towards immigrants hardening, and, and that does appear um, in the uh, in the data. But I, I'm going to unpack attitudes a little bit, though, because um, we, we talk a lot, and, and, and this just to kind of put in a bit of a broader context about the kind of global rise of populism and uh, what does that mean? And uh, um, populism is, is a bit of an umbrella term that covers an awful lot of uh, uh, people. And, and oftentimes it's used in politics to mean the people over there that I don't like and that I don't agree with. So it's, it's so um, misused that in a way it's kind of lost its meaning, but it'll say a little bit about kind of it as a term and then kind of talk a little bit about whether or not we we have Irish populism, and of course the answer is is that we we do, um, but we don't have a populist far right political party uh, that is of kind of substantive levels of organisation and impact in the way that has occurred in other European countries. And we might say a little bit about why that is the uh, is the case, and also say a little bit about who who are these uh, these voters. Um, with the the kind of hostile attitudes uh, and who do they vote for um, at the moment? So uh, I mean, just to begin, uh, populism itself um, is is generally we describe it as a, a thin ideology. So it's a kind of a set of ideas where um, you know the, the 
the, the political parties, the po political activists will kind of divide the world into kind of two groups, uh, the people uh, and the elites. And of course, the people are pure. Uh, and the elites are corrupt. And, and importantly as well in, in, in uh, populism, uh, the people are homogenous. Uh, they are all the same and, and, and there isn't any, they're, they're ethnically homogenous uh, and generally seen to have kind of similar uh, values. And a lot of kind of populist rhetoric emphasizes things like popular sovereignty and power to the people and the people should have a greater role in, in decision making. And oftentimes that's why we describe kind of kind of thin populism as anti-elite or anti-system or uh, kind of questioning or hostile to the, the political system. But populism as a kind of a thin ideology doesn't really exist in a kind of meaningful way or it's not very valuable because usually it's combined with another ideological form. Uh, and that's where we start talking about far left populists and far right uh, populists. And um, we, we certainly have uh, some far left populists in Ireland. In fact, we have political parties that lay claim to that far left populist label. Um, uh, Sinn Féin has, uh, has um, in, in public discussed how it sees itself as a populist political party on the left of the spectrum. And we would certainly identify some of the, the other far left movements as somewhat populist and, and particularly in relation to that kind of anti-elite sentiment, we see that fairly strongly. Um, we don't hear as much about the far right populism, or at least we didn't until quite recently uh, in the Irish case. And what really defines the kind of far right populism is this hostility to the other. Um, and how the other is defined is usually in ethnic uh, in ethnic or religious uh, or linguistic terms. Um, so it really is getting at that core of kind of an essentialist understanding of who the people are, uh, the people as, uh, as homogenous, and anybody who is not in the core group it is an out group, and there's hostility to that out group. And uh, that's what kind of defines far right uh, populism uh, in, much of, uh, in much of Europe. I mean, we, we often, up until about kind of 2017, 20, uh, 2018, were had kind of fairly regular discussions in Ireland about how it was kind of surprising uh, that we didn't have far right um, uh, populism because there was a far right wave sweeping across much of, of Europe uh, at, at that stage. So, I mean, we have had populism in Ireland uh, and we've had populist political parties and we've had parties that have avowedly identified themselves as, as populist. Um, you can go back into the 1930s and see kind of Fianna Fáil's uh, use of some of the kind of uh, points that I made in, on the previous slide and, and also taking ownership of the idea of, of populism. I've already mentioned, uh, I've already mentioned Sinn Féin. And um, so we have over the decades had certainly plenty of people on the, um, the, the kind of left or the statist side of, of the populist uh, debate. Uh, the, the kind of far right has been less explicitly owned and acknowledged um, by political parties in Ireland. But I think we have to be a little bit kind of in kind of evaluative of, of experiences in, in the past as well. And if we think about uh, particularly the two mainstream political parties, um, Anti-traveller rhetoric um, uh, is, is not uncommon in, in those political parties. And certainly we can all kind of point to plenty of examples over the, uh, the years. But I suppose it, it hasn't kind of been a, a mainstream core plank of ideology um, in any of the major parties. It's more kind of isolated episodes on the edges uh, of, uh, of, of um, Fáil and Fine Gael. But there are reasons to think that we would see more populism, both populism of the left and populism of the right in the last 10 to 15 years. And some of these are kind of broader, uh, parts of the broader phenomenon uh, across Europe um, that are identified as setting the seeds or laying the groundwork, if you want, uh, for, uh, for populism. The first of those was the, the economic crisis. Um, so there's two lines of argument about the emergence of the kind of populist wave that we've seen in the last decade. One is a kind of an economic argument that talks about economic crisis, the dislocation of particular groups, particularly um, working class groups who've been negatively affected by globalization, who've seen their economic conditions become much more uncertain and, uh, and who have really been disadvantaged or more specifically um, disadvantaged through the course of the uh, economic crisis that hit all of Europe um, from kind of 2008 onwards. Um, there's also um, 
a cultural evaluation argument or, or a cultural um, line of argument that's put forward by a number of academics, particularly Pippa Norris, who's based at um, Harvard. And, and she talks about kind of the, the, the social and cultural changes that have taken place over the last 30 to 40 years uh, and how the kind of emergence of multicultural, more liberal uh, societies has been a dislocating phenomenon uh, for certain groups. And, and here she talks about both working class and middle class voters some of whom will say things like, I don't recognize the country I live in anymore, or are very challenging of, for example, rights for women, um, rights for um, kind of greater respect and, and uh, for diversity in, in societies. Uh, and again, that's more of a, a longer term set of arguments, but it's one that would resonate in Ireland as well, which is seen fairly rapid, actually, cultural and social change in comparison to other countries. So a lot of her work was on uh, the United States, where the kind of roots of that change would go all the way back to the 1960s. But if we think about the liberalization of Ireland, we'd probably started in the 1990s, to be honest, and there's been very rapid change there. So on both of those levels, you would say that there are kind of reasons um, to, 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 to believe that Ireland should be susceptible to this kind of wave of potentially either left or right wing populism. Um, the, the other thing is you, you need to have opportunity structures for these parties to, to emerge. Um, and that a lot of that has to do with the way your elections work uh, and um, the way voting systems work. And, and here again, Ireland does actually have quite a flexible um, electoral system and party entry is a relatively straightforward thing. So lots of new parties appear on the political system. In two party systems, it's much more difficult where you have first past the post for new parties to emerge. So it's much more difficult for these new populist parties um, to really break through into the, the political system. And actually the UK next door is a kind of a, a good example of what we're talking about here. If you look at um, kind of Farage and, and his, um, uh, his, his Eurosceptic groups uh, in a variety of different ways, they've had tremendous impact on politics in, in the UK. But on one fundamental way, they were really unsuccessful in terms of actually gaining a foothold in national politics through general elections. And that's really to do with the structure of the electoral system and the consequent party system. In countries with proportional electoral systems, the party systems are much more permeable. It's much easier for new political parties uh, to break through and, and to get into the system. And that's why it's, it's quite interesting in case of Ireland. We've had a lot of political fragmentation. We've had lots of new political parties emerging. Um, and we have definitely seen success on the populist left, but not so much success on the uh, on the populist right. And then um, more recently, of course, you have COVID-19 and, and the anti-lockdown protests, which were used particularly by those on the far right across Europe. And Ireland has, I mean, I think it's moderate migration levels is probably uh, um, the, the best way of describing them. So just to kind of dig into this a bit, a little bit more, we've been interested in, in these questions about um, kind of populist uh, opinions and populist values uh, in voters. And we've been studying it since 2016. And what I'm going to show you are lots of different slides. Um, and I'll skip over some of them because they don't they don't tell us a huge amount about the differences. But um, we've been asking about these two separate, we actually asked about three types of populism. So we were interested in the kind of thin core, the kind of anti-system questions about populism. We were interested in attitudes to outgroups, so far-right populism. And we were interested in um, kind of redistribution questions. But none of the redistribution questions worked because everybody agreed with all of the statements. Um, because the statements we used, we took from the kind of pan-European election study, which were to do with income distribution. And there was one of them on housing and like 95 percent of people agreed with the statements so therefore we couldn't really use them because there's no variation and um, so it was very hard to see what was what was going on so I'm not going to talk really anymore about left-wing populism other than to say that we generally do have evidence from other measures and um, what I'll be talking about really is this kind of thin anti-system populism anti-politician anti-elite populism and then the kind of anti-outgroup uh, populism as well so what we do is in the election study which is a survey we do of voters after the election we ask people a whole series of questions and we ask them their opinions on on these uh, these questions so here i just have the text of the questions for you to 
to, to see. Um, so the anti-system questions are most politicians do not care about the people. Most politicians only care about the interests of the rich and powerful, and most politicians are trustworthy. And I've flipped that for the sake of the charts I'm going to show you so that all the statements go in the, the one uh, direction. And what you find is that, um, you know, very large numbers of people actually agree with these, uh, these statements. And there is quite strong anti-politician, anti-elite sentiment to be found in the, uh, in the elect uh, uh, electorate as a whole. And then the anti-outgroup statements are immigrants should be required to adapt to the customs of the Republic of Ireland. People should not have to put up with travelers halting sites in their neighborhood and asylum seekers should have the same rights to social services as Irish people. Uh, and again, we'll show you the, the much lower levels of, of um, agreement with these uh, these statements, but again, about 20% of uh, voters uh, strongly agreeing with these statements. So these are Likert scales. We ask people on a scale of, um, you know, strongly agree to strongly disagree, um, where would you place yourself in relation to this, uh, this scale? Now, some of them, we have data from 2016 as well, but um, not so much on the anti-outgroups because the questions we used the last time uh, were different. Um, but the first lot of them here are the kind of anti elite questions and, and the orange bars are the 2016 data and the, the blue bars are the 2020 data. Should have intuitively inverted those um, because they were reading backwards. But um, what I want to, to really show is that um, th there's quite a lot of kind of anti-elite sentiment um, in, the, uh, in the electorate. So if the, look at the first uh, statement, most politicians do not care about the people. And um, what you find for 2020 and for 2016 is, is that there's quite a lot of people over in that space who, who somewhat agree or strongly agree with those statements. And the other thing that you can see um, is that anti-elite sentiment has gone up um, from 2016 to 2020. So the blue bars on the agree side are higher than the orange bars. Uh, so anti-elite sentiment has actually uh, has actually increased. And, and that's the same for the second uh, one on, on the right of the, the screen. So most politicians only care about the rich and powerful. We see that a majority, um, most particularly in 2020, more than 50% of voters are, are actually in that particular space. Uh, and then um, when we ask people are, are politicians trustworthy? Most politicians are trustworthy. And um, again, you can see that there's there's a very clear travel uh, direction of travel there. Uh, most voters actually disagree with those uh, with those statements. So there's a lot of distrust and a lot of kind of hostility to the political uh, political system. So the second set of charts that I'm showing you here are just to, um, the, the the distribution for the questions on out groups. And so the first of those question charts that you can see there is asking people immigrants should be required to adapt to the customs of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and you can see that there's quite a lot of agreement with that particular uh, particular statement that kind of upward trajectory and um, we see a very similar pattern when it comes to uh, travelers halting sites it's not terribly surprising, as I say, given um, the kind of uh, experiences over uh, the recent decades. The interesting one is, is in relation to asylum seekers, particularly because of what we're seeing kind of on the streets at the moment. And that's that there's a somewhat more mixed view or certainly more sympathetic view, actually, of uh, asylum seekers. Now, it's important to say this is from 2020. This is from the election and the people who answered this were voters at that uh, at that election. So it's representative of the electorate, uh, but not necessarily society as a, as a whole. And that's probably an important caveat to keep um, to keep in mind. Um, um, so, you know, you can see that there, there's still kind of a substantial enough group of people um, on the right of that chart who, who don't think that asylum seekers um, should have the same rights to, to social services as Irish people. But it's, it's certainly a, a different distribution to the, um, uh, to, the other, uh, to the other graphs that I've shown you. Um, now, what I just want to explain and, and we don't need to spend too much time on this, but what we did is we add up uh, the uh, anti-elite sentiment into a single scale, and we add up the anti-outgroup uh, into a single scale, and we do some statistical tests in the background, and these scales actually work well together. So there is a degree of coherence and consistency um, in the values and attitudes. So generally speaking, the people who think that politicians only care about the rich and powerful also think that politicians are not trustworthy. So the actual question 
questions themselves work reasonably well together. And that allows us to create two separate um, sets of scales. Uh, and this is, um, we, we call these populism scales. So on one end, uh, you have people who are, don't really have very much by way of populist um, values. On the other hand, you have at the uh, right hand side of the scale, people that we would describe as quite populist um, in terms of their uh, their values and their, their attitudes. Um, so the first one is the anti-elites populism scale. And you can see um, that there's quite a lot of people um, you know, on, on the kind of populist side of that distribution. Uh, but importantly, the same is true also for for anti uh, for anti out groups um you know about 20 just over 25 percent of people or a quarter percent of the voters who have pretty hostile views um to um uh, to people uh, outside uh, their own kind of core group now I have a whole load of uh, more charts here that kind of break all of these things down um, by gender, uh, by um, by age, um, by urban rural location. But what I'll, I'll do is I'd kind of sum up the the slides rather than going through them all um, and say that there is actually very little by way of gender differences um, in this. Women are slightly more anti uh, system, anti elite. Men are slightly more hostile uh, to outgroups. Um, we we find hostility to outgroups is a little bit higher um, amongst people living in rural areas. Um, we find that young educated people tend to be much more anti-system, but tend to have quite low levels of um, of anti uh, of anti outgroup sentiment. So those are all patterns that are very consistent with everything we know from other European countries. And um, so the kind of Irish populist voter, if you want, is very typical of other European uh, European voters. And I think that's important to kind of in terms of understanding what's happening in Ireland. Ireland is a microcosm of kind of global politics. It's not a place apart. Um, and just because we, we haven't seen the manifestation, perhaps of far right populism here, that's not because that voters here don't have those views. They do have those views. They just haven't had expression in the political system uh, for a period of time. Now, I'll, I'll just skip through these. I'll go back to them if anybody wants to, to see them in more detail. But um, I thought it might be more interesting to look at who do these voters vote for. Um, um, so this first slide are, are um, these are what we might call the populism squared people. So these are the people with the highest level of anti-system attitudes and the highest level of anti-outgroup attitudes. Um, so these are, are really your far right populace in the Irish uh, in the Irish system. And, and this is how they voted at the 2020 general election. And, and this is probably kind of the most interesting and most important of the, the slides. Um, because what we see here is, and remember, these are a relatively small number of people now. So these are the populism squared people. We're down to about 400 voters here. Um, but they voted for Sinn Féin. Uh, and, and the next kind of largest number of them voted for Fine Gael, um, and then Fianna Fáil. Uh, and independents um, are also picking up um, uh, picking up some of these uh, these voters. But what's interesting, though, is that when we look at these uh, these parties, um, is is none of them espouse anti outgroup uh, sentiment really in a kind of a substantive kind of core plank of their their platforms. Um, we might say that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are a little bit ambivalent about travelers' rights. But I, I certainly don't think you could go so far as to say that they're hostile to the traveling uh, to the traveling community, um, and they're certainly very pro migration um, and have been pro um, um, inward migration uh, for for many many decades. And I think the same is importantly it's true of Sinn Fein as well. Um, Sinn Fein uh, does not agitate on um, kind of anti outgroup uh, in 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 its core. Um, uh, policies. It's not part of its rhetoric. It's certainly very strong in anti-elite sentiment, but not on anti-outgroup uh, anti sentiment. And what I'm saying to you here is confirmed as well. We have other ways of measuring political parties. So there's a Chapel Hill survey that looks at the manifestos of all of the political parties at every election. And um, and we don't have any major political party that's classified as a far right political party. We have a couple of small minor parties, but none of the major political parties fall, fall into this category. So what this means is that there is a mismatch between 
some of the people who are voting for these political uh, parties and their core uh, their core values. And some of that we're seeing manifesting on the street at the moment in these protests um, where there's actual specific hostility um, to, uh, to Sinn Féin. Um, so uh, more generally, when we look at kind of anti-elite populism, uh, this is kind of going back to that bigger group of people. The main thing to say here is, is that half of the electorate have anti-elite sentiment. Um, so the anti-elite people are voting for basically everybody um, across the uh, uh, across the system. And I, I suppose it, it's probably worth saying that the kind of um, th those with the kind of lowest levels of populism um, uh, in, in this distribution are probably voting for the Green Party and the Fine Gael as well, which is interesting because they're also getting kind of an equal share of, of some of the kind of the hostile and uh, the hostile groups with the Social Democrats. Uh, and you can see the distribution. But I think the most striking thing about this chart is if you look at the populist bar, that's the, the orange bar. I mean, every political party has populist voting or uh, anti-elite populist voting for them. So pervasive is anti-system populism populism um, in Irish uh, in Irish politics today and um, it's completely distributed across the uh, across the system. The picture is a little bit different when we go to anti uh, anti outgroups uh, populism. And again, here the orange bar is is the more interesting, uh, the more interesting one. Uh, and you see that Sinn Féin are, are kind of getting quite a, quite a few of anti outgroup and um, be careful of the Labour Party because they have actually uh, only a small number of voters um, and um, a very small number, one going one way or the other, um, can change their uh, can change their distribution. But in the case of Sinn Féin, there's actually a very large number of Sinn Féin voters here, um, so you can clearly see see that effect. But you can see it also um, for uh, uh, for the independents; they're capturing quite a bit of the uh, anti outgroups vote. But as are um, Fianna Fáil and and Fine Gael, uh, as as well. And so kind of that's where I kind of finish up and, and kind of throw it for anybody to ask any questions, if I can answer more, I can conclude by saying um, we have an awful lot of anti-elite um, uh, voters out there. Uh, they're a majority, in fact. Um, there's a great deal of um, uh, of scepticism uh, about the political system and hostility to politicians most particularly. Uh, there's a smaller share of um, anti outgroup uh, populace. Um, and, and there's an interesting overlap that pretty much all of the anti outgroup populace are also very hostile to the to the political uh, political system. There is coherence to some of the anti elites voting. So the, the, the people who are voting, particularly when it's a poor test, the left wing one, but when they are voting for Sinn Féin and we combine that with economic redistribution, there's a good degree of coherence in terms of the people who are voting for Sinn Féin, who are kind of critical of the political system and kind of on the left of the uh, on the left of the spectrum. But that coherence doesn't work when we look at, when we dig into that kind of um, group of anti outgroup uh, voters, the people who have kind of hostile views um, to anybody who is different. What we find is, is that they're voting for other political parties in the system, but they're not really represented in, in the political uh, system. And there aren't any serious political parties and or kind of political entrepreneurs in that space yet. Um, so there are parties there. And, and I mean, you'll all have, have seen um, Justin Barrett and Herman Kelly, and that's Dermot O'Kyla um, from Cork. And, and they're, they are there and they are on the ballot papers, but they don't get substantial electoral support, not even from the people who actually strongly agree with the positions that they advocate. So as political entrepreneurs, they're not very effective. They haven't been able to mobilize the kind of base of latent support that is there uh, for them. But what I kind of finish off by saying is, is there is a gap in the market um, and there are a substantial enough group of voters um, who are not being represented at the at the moment and who are looking for somewhere to, to go. And we see that here in the Irish National Election Study data. But I have a colleague at UL, uh, Rory Costello, who does work with voting advice applications and his work is almost identical in terms of its findings to what we find in the Irish National Election Study. So there is a lot of evidence to tell us that there are about one fifth of the electorate with kind of anti uh, anti outgroup far right type attitudes, and they're not uh, being catered for at present within the uh, in in the uh, party uh, political system.
So I'll leave it there. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be delighted to, uh, to take them and, and happy to kind of discuss things more widely as well. Great. Thanks a million, Teresa. I think that was really, really interesting. I think there's a lot to note in there. I mean, certainly it's um, there's about the broader trends, I think, of where we are at the moment. Um, but also the like, I guess, where the Green Party is, is uh, for those of us who are affiliated with the Green Party, it's, it's a particular interest to see where we sit within the the ideas of pop populism and the far right as well. Um, I if, if we can do questions via the hands up function, if that's OK, and then I'll, we'll come around that way. Um, and I guess it could, if I might start as well, just while I can see Oliver is going to come in as well, but I might just start with one, which is just around, I think, thinking about it as you're talking there around um, and just to say, sorry, regarding the the timing, we'll take about half an hour of questions now, if that's OK, just so everyone's got a, a expectation of how long we'll go for. Um, there, there's a lot of discussion around um, the the uh, ideas of whether it's the growth. So what you saw in the presentation there, I think, is the growth of far right ideas in Ireland significantly between 2018 or at least anti um, populist ideas between 2016 and 2020 in those surveys, but not electoral growth at the same time. So what you were mentioning there is about the gap between where there's support and where there's electoral growth. And there's two concerns at the moment, which is one, that what the next step that we will see is electoral growth of far right groups in Ireland. And the second one is possibly what we saw in Britain, which is the co-option of far right ideas by some of the mainstream groups in order to kind of take the rug out from underneath the um, far right electoral groups that were organizing and political groups. So I guess that brings me to my question of which one should we be more concerned about? Should we be more concerned in our system of seeing a few far right, explicitly far right um, people as opposed to maybe we have plenty of people who will espouse anti-immigration sentiments within our political system um, and anti-LGBT sentiments, anti-women sentiments, anti-Semitism. Anti we hear them from time to time, but um, particularly maybe small independence, but um, we haven't seen lot significant electoral growth campaigning on the back of those ideas necessarily, but we are maybe seeing a slow creep of the rhetoric among some of our, our mainstream political representatives as well towards some of those ideas. So I guess that would be my first question. And then uh, maybe Oliver can come in next. And if anybody else has a question, please stick the hands up there. I suppose the first thing, if I had to kind of based on the, the evidence we have before us, I would say there's probably you'd be more concerned about a political entrepreneur coming in to this space and effectively mobilizing people around this ideology because to some extent that's actually what you're seeing at the moment um, is you're seeing immigration being used to um, inflame um, um, to inflame kind of sentiment um, in very specific communities so right now what we're seeing is is that agitation starting to be more effective than say it was um, previously. So we wouldn't have had the kinds of um, anti-lockdown protests that you saw in a lot of other European countries, say the Netherlands or even Belgium, for example. Um, so that didn't work as effectively. The anti-lockdown protests tended to actually be pretty, pretty small and, and, and they really dissipated very quickly. Um, whereas there's a sense that the kind of campaign now is, is perhaps being a bit more effective. And I think there's also the fact that there's every reason to believe that the issues around migration that we're dealing with at the moment are actually going to prevail for a much longer period of time. There is no immediate kind of end, if you want, to, um, uh, to the migration challenges in the way that there kind of eventually was going to be an end to the pandemic, the can pandemic kind of faded back. So, so migration is, is, one, it's proving to be something that's effective at bringing people out onto the streets, and two, there's every reason to believe that that's going to be a more enduring and, and much more difficult um, issue to deal with. Um, it, it, it's a much more intractable issue um, over to the, the medium to long term. And if we look to other European countries, we 
see that that's where a lot of the other parties of the far right have been most effective. Um, when we look at the kind of the mainstream political parties, and um, if we look at kind of the three medium sized political parties, um, I mean, I don't think there's any at the moment strong evidence to suggest that any of them are substantively moving to the right, that they're co-opting the rhetoric of the of the right. Now that could change, but right now, um, I mean, you, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael in government and, and Sinn Féin in opposition are, are not really um, kind of co-opting the, the language of the right. They remain reasonably sensitive um, in their discussions of, of migration. If anything, actually, they kind of run away from discussions uh, about uh, my, migration. That's a little bit different to what you see in, in other European countries um, in places particularly like Austria, um, and we've seen it as well in the Netherlands and even to some extent in Belgium, where the kind of centre-right political parties have co-opted the language of the far right, and they've been pulled further to the right. You see that very obviously as well um, in the in the UK, where the Tories have been very substantially pulled um, kind of to the right of the political spectrum. A at the moment, there isn't really any reason to believe that that's going to happen uh, in, in Ireland. Um, so of the two kind of avenues that you put before me, I think the evidence is probably more for kind of agitation on the streets and, and the kind of far right becoming a more effective force organically um, than necessarily the mainstream moving. Great. Thanks very much. That's really interesting. Um, Oliver, would you like to come in? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Jonathan, and thanks, uh, Teresa, too. I, maybe it, maybe it, there's a big overlap in the question. Um, I, 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 I heard what you, what you were saying about Sinn Féin, and it's something I, I'd noticed, too, um, that Sinn Féin reps often seem to come in for uh, a, a lot more uh, vitriol uh than other reps when, when when they're you know receiving it from 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 the far right and from from from, from populists and i think maybe a reason for that is well you know they would express or expect a, a green party rep to be in support of of um you know rights for migrants and rights for women and so on um, um but they often i think f feel quite disappointed and let down by Sinn Féin because they had a different expectation um and I wonder what will happen uh, if and when Sinn Féin into government um, and, you know, there is possibly a, a bigger, you know, mismatch and, and, and gap between the expectations of, of a large cohort of, of their voters and what they have, what they do do in, in, in government. Um, and what is the experience in other countries, do you know, of, you know, when that sort of dynamic happens and what kind of pressures do party come on come under? Is it that they get pulled uh, in the way that a, you know, a cohort, or, cohort of, of voters are, are demanding them to go? Or do they splinter and does, you know, a, a portion of their 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 vote get captured by either a new movement or or something else like that? Yeah, I have to say that this is one of the questions that we discuss a lot at, at our um, workshops when we're looking at the electoral uh, data. Um, and, I mean, we can only speculate for you and I can I can share with you the speculation of, of colleagues, but I can't give you definitive kind of answers about what what will happen. I mean, at the moment, um, Sinn Féin is probably benefiting more uh, from this anti-outgroup uh, um, sentiment, the voters on, on that space part of the spectrum uh, than any of the other political movements. The next group in there are independents. Um, and going into the next uh, election, I mean, Sinn Féin will want to keep some of those voters, but it's very difficult to see how they will be able to do so if this becomes a kind of a salient live political issue and, and where it becomes part of public debate. And if you have multiple Sinn Féin representatives in public debates um, really avowedly uh, disassociating itself from, from those attitudes, that could potentially uh, become a problem before the next election. Um, but one way or another, it will potentially become an election uh, or become an issue if Sinn Féin get into government. I also don't think it's as automatic that Sinn Féin are going to be in the next um, next government, but they will be in government at some point um, in, in the reasonably near, uh, reasonably near future. The first group that are likely to benefit um, from kind of disaffection with uh, Sinn Féin are, are those that are doing well at the moment amongst that group of voters, uh, and that's independence. And there are particular 
especially rural independents um, that we can identify in different parts of the country um, that are already kind of making a name for themselves and, and really tapping into uh, that sentiment. There is a kind of an open question about where, for example, a party like Into um, might position itself. It's certainly um, I don't think you say it expresses kind of anti-outgroup sentiment, but it certainly goes closer um, to the discussions about migration. I won't say uh, expressing hostility to immigration, but certainly being more critical of immigration policy than kind of any of the other mainstream parties. And into um, it matters because it has a TD, whereas none of the other far right groups uh, uh, do. Um, the, the next question then is whether the far right groups themselves can actually organize and produce a political leader that's capable of uniting and uh, uniting them in the way that has happened in in other European countries. So you're talking about a kind of a Le Pen type character in France or Nigel Farage, and and like a lot of the time we talk about electoral systems and party systems, but you can't discount the importance of personality uh, when you're talking about populism because a lot of the most successful populist political parties really are founded on kind of charismatic personality and we don't have charismatic personality in the mix in Ireland uh, at the moment and you have to suspect that if charismatic personality doesn't emerge it'll be independence and um, maybe into and maybe kind of Sinn Féin retains some of these uh, uh, some of these these voters. But if you did have the emergence of a kind of charismatic political leader coming from the ground up, that could be a very significant game changer um, in, in terms of what will happen at the next uh, at the next uh, set of elections. Maybe not the next election, but maybe the election uh, after uh, after that. So there is a space there for a. Um, a reasonably well-supported far-right party to emerge, um, and it would definitely take votes from independents and from Sinn Féin. I, I, has that answered your question, Oliver? Is there a kind of part that I maybe haven't addressed? No, yet? I think that's that's very comprehensive. Thank you. So it is the case, Theresa, because it certainly appears to be what is notable when of the visuals of the protests is obviously Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and the Greens to a certain extent as the parties in government will be a target of certain protests but it is notable that Sinn Féin are being actively protested at some of these things in my own constituency in the north inner city it's posters of um, Mary Lou Macdonald that have been held up but traitor written across her or whatever else it is um, so it is, there is the evidence there beyond just that sort of anecdotal or observational one to say that they are targeting Sinn Féin votes. Yeah, I mean, at the moment the, that they're targeting Sinn Féin is, is more anecdotal. I mean, this protest outside Dizzy Ellis's house or mm. Martin Kenny, um, who's a rural uh, a TD. Um, there's, you know, there, there, there are enough um, um, incidents for cumulatively it to suggest that Sinn Féin are also in the in the firing line. But I mean, the, the far right also have access to all of the data that I'm sharing with you. So for them, it makes sense to particularly target Sinn Féin because the people with the attitudes that align with their kind of worldview, right now Sinn Féin is getting more of those voters than any of the political parties. So strategically, from their point of view, targeting Sinn Féin actually does make, uh, does make sense. Thanks. Maeve, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, it's it's kind of on the far right side. I'm based in Longford West Mead, and this is a constituency in 2020 where the National Party really did target because they had their deputy leader running. So I'm just wondering if you did look at geography when you're saying they didn't, like there was no impact politically of far right. Like I, I could see even, like I was kind of for the Greens, obviously, but we could see how much money they were putting in here and how much how much they were trying to kind of emphasize immigration especially in the Longford area and they were actually getting some traction like they'd serious money into like the whole campaign they got something like a thousand or just over a thousand first like first preferences something close to that and one thing in the count center was noticeable a lot of their first preferences were won for them and nobody else appeared on the ballot so there was that kind of a people around but it may be worth looking at that or kind of why they're targeting, like they're trying to build on this immigration thing, especially in Longford. But they're also very, very anti-climate change. So they hated us. They're basically, or not anti-climate change, but they're climate change deniers, the reverse, and very much targeting us. But it was very much that they seem to be targeting certain geographic areas of the country. 
to build and why they might not get a TD here. And I don't think they would next time either. They could get a counsellor because there is support. There is that kind of level of hope maybe to pull a counsellor and build from there. And the guy they ran is definitely not charismatic. So they, they'll have to work on that. But it was kind of frightening for me to see, you know, that that, that, that concentration and that kind of build here. And so just comments on maybe like geography, like when you were doing your survey, or would you look at specific areas like here? We, we wouldn't drill into any particular constituency because, I mean, our survey has about four and a half thousand um, respondents and it, there wouldn't be enough in any individual constituency to kind of go into it in, in that kind of um, uh, that kind of detail. I mean, more generally, we do know that um, kind of anti outgroup sentiment is is a little bit higher in rural areas than it is in urban areas. Um, but what's driving that really is is attitudes to the traveling community, more so than immigrants. And we can say that as a, at a general level, if you want across the uh, across the whole country, but like most of the candidates for the kind of national party are for um, Ireland, there, there, are pre, there are multiple iterations of these over the years, Ireland first. I mean, very few of them break 1,000 votes, um, which means that they're they're getting a very small number of votes in, in the system overall. They're not getting their, um, their election expenses back. But like, I think you make a really important point about the local elections. The electoral threshold at local elections is much, much lower. Um, and um, you know, a much smaller number of votes gets you elected. And the other thing is, we know that at local elections, people are much more likely to, I wouldn't say experiment, that's the wrong word, but they're, they're more like more happy to deviate from kind of their, their more kind of um, general election voting practices. So we know at general elections, people are very much motivated kind of by the major issues of the day and um, who's going to get into government. Um, and they tend to be much more hard headed if you want in terms of their voting practices. But actually at local elections, you tend to get a bit more diversity in terms of what shapes people's voting behavior. Um, and people are, are more likely to move away from their kind of longer term voting practices and that's why at local elections we get a lot more smaller political parties represented and we get many more independents so i think what you have have raised i, I can't kind of confirm it in a, a particular level of a of a constituency but i think the point you make is really important in terms of the next local elections i think the european parliament elections are also interesting because they're also second order elections now the electoral threshold is much much higher there um but people do again the exact same thing as what happens at local elections happens at the european parliament people are they're a bit annoyed with the government um they're more likely to vote against the major political parties they're more likely to vote with people who have kind of attitudes that they wouldn't necessarily support in, in the doll but they might be happy to see reflected at other levels of the election so i think it'll be interesting because i suspect they will also target the um uh, the european elections and that's because most of the people with these um uh, these attitudes are, are also very high on the nationalist scale um you know they're they're very hostile to the european union and um, and they're kind of opposed to european integration and kind of generally are um it kind of hostile to kind of internationalist perspectives as well so I mean I think in terms of the next set of electoral contests and we were doing an Irish Times podcast this morning we were talking about local elections and European Parliament elections and um, I mean that's where if, if the far right is going to get uh, a foothold that's where we're going to see it um, in, in the first instance in 2024 at the local elections. Thanks Teresa. Uh, Martin? Martin, you're back on mute there. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you, Teresa. It was it was very interesting. Just quickly, um, you talked about the, the rise of liberalism has probably given the rise to the opposition to liberalism. And you did very specifically, Teresa, say that the anti-system populism is high, both from the left and from the right in Ireland. And you know, I wanted to ask you about this. Have you views on it? I certainly have a view, <laughs> if anybody listens, but there was a change from liberalism to neoliberalism in economic and individualistic uh, policies and attitudes 
uh, which is, uh, took place in the 1990s with the founding of the European Union. And we have endorsed that in the Green Party, plus Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. And that is the noose round our neck, in my view, that there will be opposition to our system of which we are a part, unless we begin to reject the neoliberal individualistic philosophy, economic and evil ethical of, uh, of, of the, the, we call them the, the, the government at the moment and the, the parties on the, on the right and centre. That's what I want to comment, Theresa. Maybe you have an insight into that. Now, I don't have any data that I can kind of share with you because we, we haven't looked at that in, in the Irish election studies. I mean, but what I can tell you is there's been an enormous amount of research globally on, on populism and, and particularly populism of the left and populism of the, the right. And a lot of it led by um, Pippa Norris at Harvard and also a, another uh, US-based academic, Ronald Engelhart. And, and they have been exploring the kind of the roots of populism. So what has made people and become so distrustful of politics and, and what ha has it kind of ignited this populist wave uh, across Europe. And that's where the whole argument about kind of globalization and neoliberalism um, is aired fairly substantively, but it, it's, it's aired from the point of view of the transformations that it has brought about, which are common across advanced industrial democracies. And in particular, the kind of vulnerabilities and uncertainties that it is introduced for working class, uh, working class voters. Mm -hmm. And this is tested and has been explored an awful lot in relation to the Donald Trump elections, but also the Brexit vote in, in the UK. And the idea that people, and you have, you'll hear this phrase all the time, people are losers of globalization. And you know, that the, the working classes have lost their jobs, that the new kind of employment they have is much worse paid. It's, it's, um, it's much more uncertain and, and that you don't have those kind of um, blue collar jobs, if you want, that kind of would have been talked about so much in relation to the United States and um, over the decades and and there there's a lot of argument that it's that change in, in the kind of global structure of the economy and um, that has particularly ignited um, this economic uncertainty and has kind of prompted some of the working classes um, in particular to move towards um, um, kind of populist, particularly populist parties of the left, but also populist parties uh, of the of the right. And there is some evidence of that. I mean, it's it's certainly there, uh, and um, kind of we we can see it in in some of the kind of global data. I, I can't say it speak for Ireland now, very specifically here uh, on that. Yeah. Um, but but what Engelhart and, and Norris do show though is that actually the cultural evaluations are are probably actually more powerful at driving the changes that we have seen. So it's not that the economic changes aren't there, but the cultural ones are, are probably more significant, particularly in they looked at Brexit and at, uh, at Trump in driving the support there for, I mean, which effectively is kind of far right, uh, far right populism, and that it's it's the cultural, and the, the name of their famous book is Cultural Backlash, um, and, and that actually the kind of more powerful driver of what we're seeing over the last 20 years is a backlash against kind of changes in society. It's a backlash against um, kind of much greater gender equality, um, much greater rights for the LGBT community, um, um, again, particularly in relation to immigration. Immigration is, is a flashpoint uh, issue. Immigration works, though, on both the kind of um, the economic uh, side and also on the uh, uh, on the cultural side. It works on the economic side because arguments about how um, migrants are coming here, taking our jobs kind of line. But it's also on the kind of cultural side in the sense of kind of the changing nature of society, greater diversity, greater multiculturalism and what Norris and Engelhart tell us is is economics matter, but actually the cultural social side matters more. It's 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 the stronger of the two uh, of the two driving forces, but 
this is an important part for I can make my party political broadcast, election research is not funded properly in Ireland. So we've never been able to collect enough data at elections to be able to do this kind of analysis. There's an electoral commission there now, and we're kind of hoping maybe they'll be a little bit more generous about funding this type of research. But we have a lot of kind of work that's done at an international level. But the extent to which we can pull that down into Ireland is quite limited by the fact that we barely get an election study after every election, whereas in most other countries, they're collecting this data before and after every set of elections at referendums. So we're kind of hamstrung and how far we can go in terms of kind of making kind of evaluations. That, that, th thank you very much, Theresa. That's very interesting. And I take your point that in some countries like Germany, where the cultural inheritance is 1930s, 1940s inheritance, and indeed in Britain, where it's an imperial inheritance, and there are those influences. But specifically in Ireland, we don't have the cultural inheritance. And I'm suggesting it's a niche for our Green Party and our just transition Greens to take the view that it's an economic system here, which is uh, leads us leads gives us an opportunity. But thank you, Teresa. For you. Thanks. And then Simon, and then I've got a couple of closing questions. So if there's anybody else who wants to come in quickly um, after Simon, let me know. But otherwise, I've got a couple of closing questions as well. Thanks, Simon. Okay, I'm sorry I missed the first part of your talk, Teresa. But um, I, I live in the north, and I work a lot with the, with with the environmental groups around the north. Um, and one in particular, the the, the uh, Save Our Sparings Anti Gold Mining Group um, uh, has come up against big business using populism as a way of of of, uh, of trying to get their way in a, in a in a in a um, an argument over resources over over uh, you know. Um, Potentially destroying a whole a whole landscape with gold mining, um, and they've um, encouraged people. Obviously, it's difficult to, to make the direct links, but um, the conspiracy theories have, have come up a lot. So, anti-vaxxers uh, and people that are would have a whole a whole suite, a whole range of, of, of uh, conspiracy theories uh, have been uh, have attempted to to get on board the the anti-gold mining group. Uh, and sort of, you know, drag it off in that direction, in a sort of populist direction, uh, uh, which has managed to be resisted by the group largely, but, but you know, they're very conscious of that happening. Uh, the next thing that, that, that um, biz, big business has used is violence, literally, against people, to encourage violence against people who are opposing their, their, their aims. Um, and that's a very a big issue or a big... Uh, Thing in, in populist politics is, is, is the use of violence and, and threats of violence and so on. Um, and, and how do you think, I mean, outside of, of people voting for political parties or not, do you think there is a big, much evidence in Ireland apart outside of that, that, that business is using populism um, as, a, as a way of, of fighting its battles for them? Um. I'm, I'm not sure now that I'm well placed to answer that, to, to be honest. Um, like, I, I can tell you that actually, over many years, we collected data after elections about kind of legitimate use of violence. And you can all guess the obvious reasons for, for why we were collecting that data related to the kind of the conflict. And actually, over a long period of time, kind of, th there's been very low levels of support for the use of violence. Um, Kind of to further political political means to the point whereby we actually stopped collecting that data. I think we, the last time we actually even asked that question was in 2011 because support for violence. Now I'm talking about support from violence amongst voters um, is really really low and in in Ireland um, and 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 that's across the whole political uh, political spectrum um, and. Um, and you can also kind of connect that more generally, like we can see the kind of um, the rise of Sinn Féin really only happens when there's quite a bit of kind of uh, history between the episodes of violence and, and you know, their kind of rise in, in the polls. And the rise in the polls is much more rooted in economic issues than, than nationalist issues as well. It has to be, um, it has to be said. But, um, but in terms of business, like I really, I, I, I wouldn't be able to shed any light on on kind of how they 
how they act or how they operate. What you're describing to me sounds very much like the tactics of mining companies uh, all over the world, most especially in, in developing world countries where that probably gets highlighted much more much more significantly. But I, I'm not sure that connecting that to populism is, is necessarily um, going to, to work. And um, when, when you have kind of protests, you often attract kind of a wide kind of group uh, in the first instance, um, and, and particularly people with, with certain kinds of views will try and look to find any avenue to advance those, those views and, and that potentially what you might be seeing. But as I say, that's just pure speculation now on my part, rather than kind of being rooted in any particular kind of evidence. Thanks. Um, and Anthony, if you'd like a quick final question. Yeah, a very quick question. I, I believe you've answered it, Teresa, in your request for further funding, but um, that there's been no more polling data post-COVID on this topic. Um, no, um, I mean, not at the moment. Um, the, the European Social Survey asks some questions along these uh, along these lines, and, and that was kind of polled through late 2020 and into early 2021. And, and they would have some similar questions, but actually the full data set isn't uh, due out for another couple of weeks. Um, and, and that would give you some, if you're really interested in this topic, like it's a good place to go, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's done for every country. There's about 37 or eight countries actually in the European Social Survey. So you get really good cross-national comparative data. And the European Social Survey goes back to about 2002. So you have it every two years for a reasonably long period um, period of time. And um, over the years, some of the Irish data has been quite interesting in terms of, and this kind of goes against something you just said, but, but we ask a question about kind of, um, you know, uh, could dictatorship, uh, it's like a general statement, uh, dictatorship might be a better way of getting things done. And there's always a surprising number of Irish voters who actually agree with that statement. Uh, it went as high as about 20 something percent um, at the height of the economic uh, crisis. Um, but they have lots of questions, particularly about um, kind of tapping into far right attitudes. Uh, but we won't be collecting this again from our survey and um, until after the uh, the next election and our, that's why our data is kind of truncated every couple of years but we do survey voters um which is kind of why we feel our data is pretty strong these are the people who do actually go to the polls i i just I, from my own observations locally uh, and again maybe just to echo uh, Maeve's point earlier on the irish freedom party are quite active in louth and herman kelly's resident in louth so um they're out out on the doorsteps uh, leafleting on Saturday as I was doing litter picks, you know, so they're, they're, they're quite active. So my own reading on this is that they, they've sort of been energised by the COVID-19, they have sort of an inner core zealots who sort of, you know, have that mindset. So the, I think they're a bit more organised than they were perhaps at the last polling. Yeah, they're interesting because they, they made a bit of a play for kind of higher exit, if you remember as well, in, in the wake of the kind of uh, the Brexit referendum, uh, they, they kind of came together kind of under the Eurosceptic umbrella and, and tried to make a play for kind of Ireland's exit from the European Union. But I think that was always a particularly difficult case to, to, to make. One, you know, pro-European attitudes are very, very high in Ireland. And then just as Brexit got spectacularly worse and worse, um, um, maybe even worse, to quote former Taoiseach, I think our exit was going to go nowhere. Whereas the migration issue, um, just as an issue, it, it's just, it's been something that's ignited far right um, activity very successfully in a number of other European countries. And given the circumstances at the moment, you could see how as an issue, it's 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 going, it's much more likely to persist for a longer period of time. And in fact, the kind of pressures it's putting on the political system in a way are, are kind of much more acute than kind of some of the other issues that they've used. So I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily they've gotten better, but I think the issue is much more intractable and it's probably creating space for them to be more effective than they necessarily have been um, in the um, in the past. Because if you look uh, particularly at the um, 
the other crowd, uh, Justin Barrett's crowd, um, like he has emerged under various different guises over the decades. Like he was kind of an arch conservative and um, kind of advocating on the kind of no side, the kind of conservative sides of lots of referendums and, and wasn't particularly effective under any of those umbrellas because they haven't really um, kind of made it through into kind of issues of concern to voters at general elections. I think what will be very interesting to watch out for is whether immigration starts to kind of appear on the, the most important issues for Irish voters and if that happens uh, then there's there's definitely more potential for these um, uh, for these political parties um, to, to, to make headlines even without necessarily becoming particularly effective at campaigning themselves but they're also probably getting I mean, we'd like to see CEPO a bit more effective but th there's every reason to believe that these uh, these groups are receiving funding from outside of the uh, outside of the state and they're not mm. the only groups but um, I mean there's there are lots of speculation and some of it reasonably well founded uh, that the financing of political parties should be looked at much more carefully. Great thanks so much Theresa um, I guess like just my my concluding thoughts which are could open up about another three hours of discussion so I probably I won't um I, I won't kind of frame them fully in questions but I think um one of the things even what you were saying there is I know we were having a discussion recently there's a referendum that will come up soon about removing the clause and women's place in the home from the Irish constitution and one of the um issues with that is that broadcasters are contractually obliged to provide both a positive and a negative for any referendum question that is put to the public. So there will be an automatic platform given for the airing of grossly misogynistic views most of the time or anti-LGBT elements because there's a there's an element of kind of redefining the family um, beyond the, the confines of a marriage um, it will come up with the same referendum as it looks like. So I think there's a caution in there around approaching the referendums, understanding that there there will be a platform sort of given in er, taken or an uh, opportunity exploited there for a certain uh, another faction of uh, maybe far right um, views to be aired. Um, and the other aspect of it is, I think, a, a look at social media. So I had a post up on Saturday about uh, the and pro-refugee rally and overnight I got 1500 comments underneath and a basic analysis which are primarily of um, anti-immigration sentiment and views which demonstrates certainly a very organized um, or at least kind of uh, strategic idea there of targeting certain areas because that's not an organic response I can guarantee you that and um, so there's certainly and a lot of them just from a brief analysis without looking into all 1500 suggests a lot of UK American Australian influence there so we can certainly demonstrate that there is an international interest in this issue as well um, and in, in trying to drive that wedge in Ireland that has been seen in other areas and it also reminds me, and this is, sorry, I'm slightly spouting now if you'll indulge me, but it reminds me of the repeal referendum as well, where we saw a lot of international interest in, um, you know, we saw American delegations coming over in order to campaign for a no vote there and everything, and that Ireland can become a stage upon which more international battles are set, um, which raises multiple questions as to why internationally people are so interested in driving that wedge in Ireland um, and willing to spend money on it particularly. And it also, I think the big question that faces us all now is the what we do and how we respond and how we make sure that we don't allow ourselves to to maybe feel like we're scoring some cheap political points by adopting certain sort of easy rhetoric or easy ideas because um, we are being told everybody in your area you'll never be voted in again if you if you support refugees if you support um, travelers whatever else and that it feels like there's a strong push to to shift the dial and how you can resist that in a positive way um, and I think those are the questions that will keep coming up again uh, so I don't want to kind of over labor them tonight um, but I think it is important that we are continually continuing to have those conversations um, and continuing to sort of look at how we as a party and we as a collective environmental advocates and um, environmental justice advocates continue to sort of push um, positive pro-integration, pro-diversity, pro-immigration um, 
views and policies across the way and we don't allow ourselves to be cowed in them I guess in some way um but also uh responding in an earnest and engaged way so um with that I'm going to hand over to you for the final word in it because I, I I've had my own little speech there but um th but just from me just thank you so much for your time and for your energy in the presentation this evening and I think an awful lot of food for thought and this certainly has to be a kind of live conversation for us I think over the next as this in our own communities, in our own politics is sort of unfolding at the moment. So this has been a really useful uh, starting point or continuing point for, for those discussions. So I'll hand over for the final word, Teresa. Thank you. Thanks a million. I mean, I I, I suppose I'd, I'd leave you two points. One is the Greens are the anti-populists, you know, um, that, that in, in terms of your, your voters, um, they're the people at the kind of left-hand side of all of my scales, much more likely to be at the left-hand side of, of, of the scales. They're actually more trusting of the political system on average than a lot of the, the other political parties are perhaps more positive about what the political system can do for them, I suppose, is, is one way of, say, uh, of saying it. But the other thing is, is that nothing in politics is certain you know, and, and what looks like it might become an issue right now, you know, it could fade and fizzle and, or it could develop, but, but we shouldn't be too deterministic and, uh, and, and shouldn't be too, I, I, I think, um, uh, kind of put off about the, the future politics can, can change very, very quickly. Um, and, and so what might be a kind of a major flash at the moment, it could, it could fizzle away um, as equally as, as it could become the kind of major challenge of, of the future. And that's why I think it's probably very valuable to be um, kind of having these conversations uh, and also funding political science research. But thank you very much for having me this evening. Thanks very much. And I will offer you our round of applause from behalf of everybody because it's a little bit difficult on Zoom, but thank you so much and good luck with their, your um, ongoing work and your um, contribution to this area. I think it's really, really important. So thank you so much for all that. And thank you everybody else for your time tonight and your engagement on the subject and very much looking forward to continuing this one. Thanks so, very thanks much. Very Have much. a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.